Um, it's always it's such a pleasure to come back to Sosfei every summer. It's, a, it's become very much part of my, uh, my process of sort of saving up something to work, work, work on while I'm here. Um, and so um, the talk that I've um, prepared tonight, um, um, there's some parts of the, at the beginning that are a kind of reca recapitulation of some earlier work on issues around vision, but um, the bulk of it is, is all new material. Um, some, many, much of which um, is uh, sort of formulated in, in relationship both to the, 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 some of the discussions we've been having in the seminar and also to the, this amazing symposium that we, that we put together uh, around this as well. And so as you see, the titles changed a little bit, um, which is more of a, a, a bit more truth in advertising um, it, it is at this point. And so um, I look forward to going into this. You can see part of what I'm, I'm interested in here is, is, is the is the question of, of vision. I'm going to, however, make sure that I get my notes. So if you'll forgive me for the showing of this as well, I will have my presenter notes on here and we can, we will go through. Okay, so um, of the talks that I've done done here and the talks that I generally do, they kind of sort of come in two flavors. One, there's the, the everything all at once kind of uh, talk, like the stack in one day. Kind of thing where here's a 30,000 foot overview of how the world works and everything in it and why it's, why it's there and everything else. And then other ones where I try to sort of go the other direction where I might take one little small thread of something I'm working on and try to see how far it might pull um, and to see what much connected to. And tonight's talk is very much the second one. It's also from, um, would come from uh, a book in progress, the, the follow up book to stack um, is will be on on AI um, and sensing and 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 its issues for art and design um, and philosophy and economics and politics um, more generally um, but what the I, I think what the the, the really um, the armature the idea that the, around this will hang on hasn't quite arrived yet and, and one, you know I've been having some conversations with some of the students here about where the stack thesis came from and you know, it really went through probably four or five iterations of the book, um, and there was a kind of end note that I was writing where in the last chapter, I'm looking at something and writing this end note, and I say, you know, you kind of, if you look at this whole thing together, it kind of forms a little bit something like the hardware software stack, um, and sort of writing this and realized that that's how I was explaining this, and then thought, oh, fuck, I have to rewrite the entire book now, because I actually, now that I figured out what the book is actually, what the structure of the book is about, um, now I can put it on this thing, and so this, we're not quite there yet with this, but this is all part of this kind of process. Um, another thing uh, that's part of motivating this, um, um, part of this in the interest as well, is the sense that our, our, the schema which, which we are using to try to make sense of what, whatever artificial intelligence is, whether it actually constitutes thinking or not thinking, or merely a mechanical operation, um, as some seem to hold um, from our discussions at the symposium, whatever it is, is something that our schemas that we have available to us are, are, are not giving us the metaphors to discuss, to th think about. The, what, whether it constitutes a kind of master's house that we either can reassemble or not reassemble, given the, the tools of this as well. Whether it's, it's, a, whether it's a scary city or a, 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 a utopian city through which we want to go. What the model metaphor for really understanding what's at work here, I think, is something that really is eva that evades us. And something I want to figure out and sort of arrive at and, and get a sense of what, what, what this. I, because I, think, I do think that the types of phenomenon that are represented under this banner, which are not all the same thing, and many of the things that we call AI today will likely prove to be, turn out to be very many different things. They weren't all one thing after all. Um, uh, represents a tremendous challenge, but also an opportunity, a kind of way in which that the inheritance of certain categorical and interpretive systems, ways in which we've understood a, a, a necessary relationship between language and technology or image and technology or how it is that we are inherited biases and categories in the world is due for a, a, the possibility of a kind of reset. Um, and it's this, this is the invitation that I hope to do. And I, I would say that if after, if in several years that, that AI emerges and becomes clear as to what it actually is or is not, if, if philosophy itself is, remains um, intact as it was before its encounter of AI, I will be disappointed. Because I think it, would, it means that we weren't up to the invitation of the provocation of what AI 
uh, might mean with this as well. Okay, now within this larger space of AI, what I'm, what, what I'm looking at is, is not so much intelligence, but as I've made an argument in a lot of, in, in both on our symposium and other ways, is that part of what we learn from AI is ways in which that the connection between how it senses the world and is in the world and maps the world and how it thinks the world, whatever it's doing, are so closely linked together that the distinction between sensing and thinking is, is, is closely coupled that we may have to, we can never really to separate them um, it, 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 this as well. And so among these forms of sensing is what we call, and I have this in scare quotes here, computer vision. And that is well, presuming that what we now call vision, what computers do and how they process and sense photons and then produce patterns or reactions to those photons, we call vision bec like we, because it appears to us like vision and because it's, there's an analogy for this as well. And so the question of whether or not we need to come up with a new word to describe how, what, how computers <clears throat> see and keep the word vision to describe how animals process photons, um, or whether or not we expand the term of vision to include all of these different kinds of operations, but doing so with greater attention to the particularity, specificity, and limitations of our own capacity, but see our, as seeing this, what, how it does it as a kind of cousin operation. Undetermined, but this is still part of the question of our the limits of our hideous language. So I wanted to talk then a little bit about sort of vision and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of uh, begin with a few sort of unstructured um, meditations on this uh, as well. Uh, the history of imaging technologies is of course quite old, cameras obscura going back to many, many centuries in China and, 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 and into Europe as well, um, and represent a, a couple of things of from interest to us, both the, the um, an early, not only in early experiments with the capacities of producing um, a kind of synthetic vision um, and the experiments and in, in understanding and in, in perhaps alienating ourselves from the procedures of our own perception as to sort of see perception from its own um, outside, but also re inscribing at the very beginning the architectural um, model in relationship to how those processes, mechanical visions, have worked it so that the media and architecture bound together in really close um, and structured sort of ways. All which are dependent in many ways, in, 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 in ways that are both quite lovely and confusing and, and exhilarating on the resistance that surfaces provide um, to light. And in, the, in, the, in this resistance, it becomes possible for us to, um, is for us to see something that appears to us um, in, an imagistic, uh, in, in an imagistic way um, and then enter into the manipulations of this again. And again, I want to think of this as a kind of not only as a technology of perception, but a technology that enables the, the abstraction of perception as something in and of itself about which we could say particular things and manipulate and produce subsequent technologies such as, per, per, such as um, uh, formal perspectivalism, um, itself a, kind, a, a different kind of technology of vision, not that one that produces an artificial image on our retina or on the surface of the world, but, but a subdivision and rationalization of this procedure. One that has, back to the question of this conjunction of the synthetic image and architecture, one that was used, as we know, in many ways for the definition of the ratios and proportions of architecture itself and becomes an important part of how it is that we see and, and, and model those kinds of, the, the sort of systems of order um, and, and from this as well, um, which then takes on its own, it's, it takes on a life of its own um, as this, the logic of that um, perspectivalism and the productions of a ordered, a, a, vis, a rationalized visual order, such as obviously Bentham's Panopticon, um, is inseparable, as we, we should well know, from the various regimes of governance and governmentality um, in which we are still in which we are still stewing and soaking. Another history we want to be attentive to, both in terms of this technologies of vision as a, as a form of abstraction. The first one I meant to underscore this capacity for abstraction and alienation from the, this, a productive alienation in the abstraction of how it is we see vision from this outside. Another one we'll, we'll want to be attentive to um, and bring and, and, and think of the development of, of computer vision as perhaps as part of the continuity is the really material chemical underpinnings of the, um, the modern history of the artificial image. Um, the camera, of course, being a kind of genealogical derivative of the camera obscura, we begin to figure out that if you put a, not only you can build a building where you have the inverted image, but if you put a 
if you put a material surface on the far side of this and you cover this material surface with very specific kinds of chemicals, not only will the photons project onto this image, but they'll, they'll, they'll in, in, in essence, write themselves into that surface by the chemical response um, to this, and we can capture that event um, as an artificial construction, right? And so we, make ve we then shrink the camera obscura very small into the form of a camera that we walk around with, bringing this chemically sensitive material with us, exposing it to the event with the gets trace on it as well. We then build very big cameras obscura called theaters in which we have another pinhole light that shows what the first cameras had produced and so on and so on. But that the, 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 we want to be always attentive to the surficial and material, the, the, the biochemical underpinnings of the structures of the images that we produce and how it allows us to produce forms of images that we may never have seen before. We're interested, and in, in part of this research is also looking at some of, re looking back again at some of the, um, um, let's say, the kind of psychopathologies of the mechanical image in its earlier kind of era. Um, and the, 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 the ways in which double exposure techniques, for example, were thought of as being a, 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 a kind of index, indexing of some kind of supernatural event. And that the spookiness and weirdness that, the particular, that a particular surface and a particular kind of box could capture an event and produce a representation of it in of itself. And that you could then re rewrite that image back on the surface. Lots of, you know, many of the early images were you know, producing a, these double exposed images that people thought would bring themselves back to life and the rest of this as well. Now, all much to say then about the, the cinematic, um, the, um, then the photographic and cinematic language with which are the later discussions, psychoanalytic discussions of how the unconscious works and mental imagery works, which then were, forget, were sort of forever re-understood re, 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 re and re-inscribed as being um, a kind of, um, a, a, as having a correspondence with the cinematic and with the photographic as a different kind of synthetic experience. Um, this as well, supernatural or not. Now, cinema itself then were took in, in many different ways dealt with the materiality of its own image um, in, 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 in any number of different ways from the apparatus theory of the of the, the of the of the um, of the theater Baudry um, to what, an attempt to represent in an allegorical or realist way the material conditions of a political economy so forth and so on, but also much more direct um, projects like Stan Brakhage's um, Mothlight films, um, in which films that were made um, without a camera, um, with a projector later on. But as, as you know, Brakhage would take the celluloid film, take things that he finds in the world leaves and dirt and bugs and flowers and pollen and affix this to the film and then as it runs through the projector you have this very beautiful and very beautiful and compelling other very different kind of uh, material image a different way in which the image can be produced in this kind of reaction it's still where it's the 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 substrate of the image is produced again without the camera without the chemical sort of structure but then when it's exposed to the photons only later through the projection is something like an image or an emotion, a moving image produced in this as well. Right? Still in many ways among the most compelling um, material cinema that you would want, would want to think about. And something that I think will come back in our discussions of the materiality of the image for machine vision as well. Um, a third history that I want to um, convey to the problem of computer vision is that of the interfacial image. Um, one of the weird things about images of the last um, several decades in the form of graphical user interfaces is that images now do the thing that they represent. That for the history of the, synthetic, the history of the artificial images, they might represent something in the world, but now with the, the image that when you click, it does something that has some kind of semantic correspondence to the thing that's being represented, images in, as, in their interfacial mode are now functional in a way in which they, not, they, had not been, um, bef they had not been before. And the functionality of the image, it, I think that we'll talk about with computer vision, draws from this as well. As, as we discussed a little bit in the seminar, we also want to think about the interfacial image in terms of its diagrammatic capacity and its cartographic capacity. This is all Adrisi's early world maps from, from um, for uh, King Rajirina among the early world maps of the world, a, a sort of a, 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 truly a, an essential diagram in thinking about how it is, that in the Piercean sense of the diagram, um, of rep representing the complexity of a system that would exceed direct experience, in this case, cartographic. Or Menard's diagram of, um, centuries later, in the, in the of Napoleon's march into Moscow, 
another key moment in the history of this of the diagram and this function in this different functional image. If you don't know the Maynard's diagram, it represents I don't know seven or eight different uh, features and functions of this event. The simplest one to sort of understand is that that beige um, line at the top, that the Paris is on the left and Moscow is on the right, that the beige line at the, and, the, and that the movement is also a timeline, not just a geography, but the, and that the beige line at the top re represents the number of troops that Napoleon marched fr from Paris to Mo east to Moscow. The black line represents the march of the, the number of troops that made it back to Paris from this as well. Now, the diagram as a this, as this function structural image has this really, it, there's of course this amazing capacity to organize, not, not just to represent an icon, you know, iconographically or indexically something, a thing or event that happens in the world, but to also represent the relations between those things that happen in the world. And, and this is its special status. But that chain of representation between the event in the world and the thing that is represented in the image in the static diagram is one way. There's the event to the diagrammatic image of the event. As we discussed, one of the, one of the, the, the novelty of the interfacial image, that is the diagram that when clicked does the thing that, it acts back upon the thing that the diagramming is representing, represents a shift in the structure. And so that again, you manipulate the image of the thing, you manipulate the image in the diagram in some sort of way, and one hopes there's a semantic relationship between the gesture and the manipulation of what it is that you've chosen and the outcome of this as well. And in doing so, there's a recoupling or doubling of that chain of representation between the event to the diagram and now the diagram back to the event itself. The image becomes functional and the distinction between, and this is, as I say, is, is strange within the history of technologies in that you have a technology that operates, not in, that operates through the semantics of, a, of an image and it's unusual in the history of the image and that the image itself does what it represents. Okay, now, as, as we, just at the history of the interface, um, as the imagistic interfaces with the computer is not necessarily specifically tied to the computer. Computer interfaces have operated in lots of different kinds of ways. Here's a particularly um, opaque, um, uh, not particularly user-friendly um, interface, but still a beautiful one in its, own, in its own right to actually physically you know, flip the rings on the, um, flip the, uh, remember, copper rings in a, in a physical memory system. Earlier, inter earlier computer interfaces required more understanding of what was happening lower in the stack of the computer system. You, needed, you need to try to tell the computer what to do on the computer's terms, and so that the buttons you would push that would cause the thing to happen required you to, to know what to tell the computer to do. Much later on, we figured, you know, as, as graphical user interfaces from Douglas Engelbart through Apple and so forth and so on, the amount of tr the translation work between how the computer, th the human thinks the computer works versus how the computer actually works moves further higher up in the stack and that the computer does much more translation for the hominid at the top to describe what it does in terms that the button pushing um, creature uh, is likely to understand based on its own of skeuomorphic affordances of the world. Yeah? Um, interfaces develop in all kinds of ways. They begin to have other kinds of organizational structures and capacities of this as well. And again, not only in, in imagistic. So I want to, I, the reason I'm mentioning this is because I want to underscore the, the, this function of the functional interfacial image in relationship to computer vision, but also um, uh, demonstrate that this condition of interfaciality in relationship to the co computational system was not always visual, and the fact that it became visual is something of, of, not, of, of significance. There's also, the interfaces in a way always, you know, what, what they are, as we talked about, they function as a kind of map reduction for how it is all the possibilities of a machine or system might operate. And in doing so in that map reduction function, they encode necessarily a lot of um, uh, cultural dispositions and, 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 and peculiarities and how it is that one assumes what a user may want to have and what a user might need to do. Um, they are they are artifactual in this way, um, including, for example, the Sage early warning um, uh, early warning system, um, one of the first uh, integrated computer networks that the um, U.S. military used to to try to detect ICBMs across the surf coming across the North Pole from Russia. And of course, you've got guys sitting there late at night using those 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 those, those gun things to move across the things as well, and they're seeing this as well. And so, it's considering how long they're sitting there, and this being the 19 the 1960s, of course, you need to build an ashtray uh, into the interface, interfaces itself. 
um, which we don't do quite as often as we, uh, as we used to. This is, this is about. Anyway, it's a nice set of artifacts. Now, now, going back to the, the specifically imagistic versions of this, um, let, me, let me just re repeat the point that a, a part of what we're interested in this, with the graphical user interface and the shift to this visual model of images that do something, and not only do something, but do particularly what they represent, um, is certainly not a necessary function of this as well. And so just so that we might say that with software we have a kind of a technology that operates as a language and a language that operates as a technology such that that distinction is collapsed to a certain degree. The same with the image and technology of the graphical, um, if the graphical user interfaces. There are also interfaces to the extent to which that they are map productions for how the system works. They also function as, disc, as, as machines for aspirations for how it is we might like that system to work. Um, my favorite sort of example of this is um, a friend of mine named Jeff McFetridge was the guy who did the production design for the Spike Jones movie, Her, uh, in which he designed a lot of the interface systems and the device and structures for how this sort of thing would work and how the OS would work, and a lot of other things going on in, the, um, in, in this environment. And he put a lot of this artwork online on his website so people could download and make use of it and this thing as well. And if you ever saw the movie, the thing that he was kind of surprised about is that of all of these kind of utopian interface, aspirational interfaces that they were designed for the movie, the one that people downloaded and collected the most was the image of Los Angeles with a, with a functioning subway system. <laughs> that was the aspirational utopian that really set up their base as well. Now, as we also talked about, there's a problem. One of the things we may be concerned with, the augmented reality and other sorts of interfaces of this as well, is that they collapse the space of interpretation between the way in which a, a, an event is interpreted, the way in which one might interpret the event, and the way in which the, the interface provides a kind of set, a kind of set categorical interpretation of this, where this becomes where this becomes laminated more directly onto the field of vision. And this problem of this collapse of a space of interpretation is something we want to be attentive to. Okay, now. However, that said, what we now I mean to translate to sort of the meat of the discussion here. Um, we're interested then, no, however, in not only the way in which these kinds of systems might operate as intended, we're interested perhaps more so in the ways in which they produce something totally unintended. And that, that like a new medium or new musical instrument really hasn't come into its own until we figure out how to make good noise with it, not how to make good signal with it. How it is that, this, how it is that, this, that these kinds of systems may see wrong, quote unquote, and see in a way that we wouldn't have seen before and allow us to see our own seeing in a way we hadn't seen before is what we want to work with this as well. And one of the things we figure out right away is that what to us looks like realism, to it looks like abstraction, and what to us looks like for it abstraction looks to us like realism. And the problem of representation, which is this the key part of this is one, is one that is put into play in very strange and interesting ways by the development of computer vision. Um, in this. And so we have lots of ways in which it, we, something that may seem quite abstract to us um, is actually quite um, a, a quite direct imprint of the world for the computer vision, uh, for the computer vision system, which is, I'll get into in, 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 in more detail. Okay. Now, Taking a step back then to on this question of vision and train, I, what I would want to do is to locate the appearance of computer vision within a larger trajectory of the evolution of, and genealogy of vision per se. Vision has evolved many times. Um, it wasn't happened once and then there was all, and then once this one animal figured out how to see all that sort of spread like a rumor from there. Um, various photoreceptor cells across the phyla have evolved into different, um, uh, have evolved many different kinds of chemoreceptors um, and most, most likely, well, and as far as we can tell, the earliest version, most likely well in advance of any kind of brain-like information processing um, organ. Um, and arguably in the past two decades, vision has evolved once more. This time not for cuttlefish or rattlesnakes, um, but for CCG, uh, charge couple device sensors and other kinds of algorithmic armatures, um, processing what is sensed into differentiated and mo motivated recognition quote unquote visual uh, sensors responding to light, often but not always shaped like cameras, sometimes they're just surfaces, um, are one kind of design, again, a kind of design surfaces that is capable of synthetic sensation and computational interpretation, but in the wider urban landscape, as, I, as I've indicated in our seminar, they co-mingle with networks of other kinds of super, sur, su, um, superficial synthetic sensing in a much more 
uh, a much more dynamic uh, amalgamation. Some of them sense motion, pressure, heat, ambient air qualities, and so forth. And to the extent that, and again, to the extent that it's epistemologically and functionally convenient, we call these things uh, variously machine vision, machine hearing, quote unquote, machine skin. But as I, I will accede in advance, any correspondence to and from the mammalian sensory system is, is probably allegorical. Okay, now, I think this also has to do with this question of the, um, there's also an interesting way, this is proving to have different ways in which we think about the question of originality and the copy in relationship to the machinic and mechanical image. For seeing, for thinking animals, uh, seeing and making something might be easy, but making a copy of what is seen is hard. For machines, on the other hand, making copies is a way of seeing and is much easier than thinking or perhaps even becomes a kind, perhaps even becomes a kind of thinking. And so for the media technologies that link the two, when information is scarce, when information is scarce, say pre-Gutenberg, then copying something is the work of the mechanical image. However, when information is abundant, especially overabundant, then seeing the original and picking out its pattern out of the background and figuring out which one's the, the true one, the original one, the actual, the actual thing that you're looking for, the real target, this becomes the work of machine, this becomes the work of machine vision. And so if you want to think about it in terms of Benjamin's thesis of the, the image in the age of mechanical reproduction, we need another kind of half of this arc. And so we move from the erratic original to the mechanical image that's based on the copy. And now as the image itself becomes increasingly mechanized, it, it's, it's focused back again on the project of discerning and determining the original, the specific, the actual target. It actually goes back around again. Now, today, um, with the sort of proliferation of, com of machine vision systems, many images are made for no one. This does not mean that they are functional. It's quite the opposite. Um, Harun Faroqi, Peter Gallison both have written sort of extraordinary pieces on what they call this problem, the functional image, which is where they talk about the machine, machinic image. They are made, these images, in many cases, they're made by machines and for other machines to see the world. Different, and, and it works differently than we do. They, again, they don't have eyeballs, they don't have rods and cones, they don't have a visual cortex, but they do have sensors that detect light and motion, form, color, and heat in other ways. Um, we would also, another lecture would, have, would be on the problem, the predator-prey relationships or the conditions of sexual selection and this sort, but the problems of camouflage and how it is that things evolve in, really, in terms of a, a kind of bottom-up strategic capacity to be, to be seen or not seen by other things that are looking at them in particular kinds of ways. The same process is at work for, machinic, for the machinic phylum that it sees itself and the world that may or may want to be seen by that vision in different ways. And so these dynamics of opacity, transparency, and illusion um, are not resolved by this, um, the, uh, some sort of a machine vision. They're, simply, they're actually probably let loose once again in a different kind of dynamic. And it would probably make very strange things for us because how it is the machine vision sees the world is very different than how we see the world and how something may hide from the machine vision may cause it to look quite strange to us. Yeah, okay. So uh, the example of this, of this was like in early, film, in early black and white cinema, actors would wear green face paint because that, made them, that makes their skin tone look normal on the old black and white film. And so I think the sense in which where cities are becoming increasingly full of these, these sorts of systems, we're going to see the, the equivalent of green face paint architecture uh, quite prominently. Now, I would also sort of try to, again, to this question of how, we want, how generic or specific do we want to deal with this question of vision. You know, we can open this up quite far if we want to. We could argue that if we really want to think of vision as simply a way in which we have a, a, a systemic and uh, a systemic response to light um, and photons that is turned into a process, then photosynthesis as a chemical response to light would, in the broader sense, count as a kind of a vision. But in this case, it's a vision without images, a vision without images, or a vision without representation. And this problem of a vision without representation is also one that's, very, that's really important to how it is we need to understand what's going on inside those net neural networks. Because they're also, in a way, a kind of vision without representation. Or a vision without representation, unless we coax it into representing something because we're demanding it to do, to, demanding it to do so. Now, as said, the, sort of, the animal vision image making nexus is obviously primarily human. Um, monkeys and cuttlefish and rattlesnakes don't make a lot of artificial images, um, and at least it, the birds do. Um, it's likely that from the beginning to the end of the Holocene that the total quantity of images that humans have produced from cave walls to FaceTime 
um, you know, this increases exponentially every year. And by, and, and by lots of different estimates, depending on how you look at it, depending on how you measure an image in terms of the data that's in the image, the discrete file of the image, um, so forth, so forth, and so on. That by um, the most recent one that I that I saw was that all of the images made since the year two thousand eight are more than all, that. That's a larger number than all of the images we have made as a species before the year two thousand eight, depending on how you qual quantify an image. But the point is that there's a, a an explosion in the quantity of this, such that if you are a disinterested alien species and you wanted to look at the visual culture of the things on Earth right now you would primarily be looking at the, the images that got produced since that time, and most of the images, and many of the images that since, since that time were produced by machines for other machines to look at. So it's not, at some point in the future, the, the image making process of what happens on, the, on Earth will be primarily not just about human images. It, that's already the case. Um, and this, I think, has obvious implications for how it is we want to think about how all of this works. Now, um, or how we fit into it. Now, um, still, the machinic visual sub, now, the, the, the um, uh, I, I, the, one of the things I'm, I think was sort of in, important to us to think about is like where, where, where then does something, since so much of our, our understanding of, of, of a kind of uh, subjectivity, uh, subjectivity in various different ways is tied to is such a particular discourses of the ocular, um, both in terms of the, the both in terms of our, our, our eyes and our, our, our and the way in which our eyes sees, but also the way in the kinds of images and gaze and logics of, and the extensions of these sort of opular apparatus in this as well. Um, the displacement or undermining or shifting of the importance of these towards a different a different kind of relationship between inside and outside, between the trace and the form, between content and form, and so forth and so on. This is all part of the assignment of in a way in which we need to sort of think. Think out, and, and and one of the starting points in terms of the ocularity of the subjectivity is also um, thinking hard about how it is that one one how it is that these things see us, and um, I think there's something interesting here, and like seeing ourselves through the eyes of the machinic other who does not and cannot have an affective sense of aesthetics. I'm not saying that the machine has aesthetic somewhere in its brain. It, it, it's able to make what are functionally equivalent to aesthetics judgments without having an aesthetic judgment, which is weird and interesting and nuts. Um, but seeing ourselves through the eyes of this machinic other, which sees us not as a, would not scan the room as I would and focus on faces and the humans and the eyes and the gaze and repeating this because I, this is the way in which you know we've learned to scan this landscape. It would simply see all of us as another a, essentially, a, a, a kind of surface on which it would have to differentiate into particular kinds of forms, no better or different than other sorts of things around it. And the kind of um, indifference of machinic vision is, I think, is an important kind of um, there's a, the, this disenchantment of this um, is more than just like hearing the recorded sound of your own voice on on tape. That that's not me. Um, I think it's potentially more like. It potentially is something more clearly clearing away of a more closely guarded illusion. Um, that the uncomfortable recognition in the machine's mirror is a kind of, again, a kind of reverse uncanny valley. Right? Instead of that thing being creepy because it's not quite human, um, instead of being creeped out at how slightly inhuman the creature in the image appears, we're creeped out about how unhuman we ourselves look through the creature's eyes. Yeah. Um, now, there's other ways in which it also sees these things in terms of surfaces and sculpture. And Alex, Alex Galloway has a talk that he does on the sculpt, looking, looking at Zach Blass's work, on the sculptural genealogy of, of machine vision and how it has and understands and registers the surface and structures of this as well. And, and, and I look forward to talking to Alex a little bit about this as well. Okay, so I can't do a talk on machine vision without at least quickly touching on uh, Google Deep Dream. Um, we've talked a bit about the dog face finding problem um, a, a little bit in our seminar here as well. Um, one of the things that we want to attend to here, there's much to say about Deep Dream, and I've had the pleasure of having lots of conversations with the group that, that did this. Um, a, a, a recently, but it may have, I, I think one way to think of this is not only a discussion of apophenia, that there's a way in which that it's, it's hallucinating dog faces that aren't actually there, but the way in which we read the image as being dog faces, that there's a second apophenia that's there. Like it's producing a structure of form where it's learned rules that are related to dog face, and it produces those deformations on the image without knowing what a dog face is or looks like. We see a dog face because it's made something that's ugly. So it's a kind of apophenia of the apophenia all along down the line. 
and again sets in motion the different dynamic of this, like what constitutes real and, and abstraction um, in this, this as well, and, all, and, and so forth and so on. Um, Again, food is not, you don't want to do food with the whole deep dream thing as well. But now, there are, I mean, all, the, all of these algorithms are now available online. You can work with them. You can put your vacation photos into them to uh, startle your friends. Um, whatever it is that you like to sort of do. And, it, it, and of course, it's looking for dogs because it's, we're using the image set training algorithm. Um, and, and again, you know, it may find dogs in pictures of you, but, you know, back to thinking in terms of Diogenes and the dog-like cosmopolitanism of us all, maybe this isn't so... We shouldn't be so offended of this as well. There's also something to say about the when, it, when a, an intelligence is capable of apophenia, this may in fact be a kind of evolutionary accomplishment. Um, and the apophenia that we see, and that, that we're, you know, it, but it doesn't, uh, it, 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 part of the issue that I then want to turn to, has to do, which I'll turn to a bit later, is that we have our own, uh, the apophenia that we are, that we are um, beholden to are not just perceptual apophenia, they are also historical and ideological apophenia. There's ways in which that cause and cause and correlation biases between who and what is like who and, and, and what other kinds of things. The way in which we miscategorize ourselves and miscategorize our understandings of history itself are apophenic processes that we that we need to be careful that we don't encode back into the AI systems, but rather treat try to uncode them and decode them from this as well. In the meantime. Um, we have a few years, or perhaps only months, um, where as the AI systems are beginning to figure out how stuff works in the world, um, and that they're um, like, you know, interacting with a, with, with a three-year-old, um, they come up with the most amazing things sometimes that you wouldn't have, no one ever would have come up with into themselves. And so this is from the Google, Google Translate AR app, which you can have on your phone, you hold the camera up to, in this case, a, a Korean restaurant menu in Moscow, um, and it will translate that into um, English. And sometimes it gets very, it makes, it gets, makes very interesting um, ontological pronouncements <laughs> about the, the equivalence of things um, in this as well, for example. Um, or invites you to do very kind of um, uncomfortable uh, and <laughs> intimate gestures. Um, <laughs> uh, and I, we want, and we, I think we want to, I think there's, a, there's another project is to take the Google Translate and try to translate as much as we possibly can while it's still broken. Um, uh, and, and, and do a book. Uh, that's based on, you know, the, so the wit and wisdom of Google Translate <laughs> um, as it goes forward as well. Okay, now let's shift um, a little bit to um, to neural networks because this is kind of what the bulk of the, this is really the meat of the meat um, of the produce this, of this as well. And so the neural networks that I'm talking about here are the same neural networks that are that we were talking about um, at, at the symposium of uh, structure of input layers, multiple layers of hidden layers, which could be 10, could be 10,000, um, and then the output layers, which would produce um, a result um, in the structure and image um, that we're working with this as well. And so just to make sure we're on the same page, it's the same convolutional neural networks that we were talking about a few days ago, it's the same neural networks that I'm talking about here as well. And, and, and literally every day there's something I find or someone shows me something, in this case Xander we were talking about, which is something new and interesting and weird about uh, research on machine vision and convolutional uh, neural networks. This is a collection of, so basically, um, you, I forgot the technical term for this. Universal adversarial perturbations. No, that's the next one. Oh, that's the next one. Yeah, yeah. that's the next one. Uh, basically what these, uh, you can figure out, but basically, what, let, let me know. And this is, basically what these are is that if you train a neural network, and I'm skipping ahead a little bit because I want to sort of provoke the, why this is interesting. If you train a neural network to figure out what all of the images, of all of the things in these images that, that correspond to that's a dog or that's a, a shark or that's a hammer or that's a llama or whatever it is it, it wants to do, it produces a, a kind of physical rule set that would describe the parameters of what that thing is. Yeah? That doesn't really look like that thing in the way it looks to us. So these are, for examples, um, once you then ask uh, one of the layers within the network, or a couple of the layers in the network, to specify at a certain point um, what, in a way, you can think of this sort of the or image that would describe, or the or sort of description of this, which we, then we render to us as an image. These are the kinds of things that you get. Can you read it from here, from this as well? Right. So as far as it's like, that's the ultimate 
chain link fence, acoustic guitar, cauldron coil, of this is the, this as well. So this is there's a, a much longer description of, of specifically how these kinds of works as well. The idea, the, the point to reiterate again is that what for the machine vision is, may in fact be the most directly, quote, realist representation of the thing that it's looking at may for us be quite abstract and vice versa. Um, these are the universal adversarial perturbations where in which something that looks quite real to us is that abstract to the, to the AI. So here's an interesting thing. There's a way just sort of that's sort of recent, more relatively recent image that can, um, may set things off in a very strange path. So what you see here on the left is an image of what to us appears to be a panda bear. Um, and the network has, as it says, about a 57% confidence that what it's found is a panda bear. What's happened is we figure out that if you introduce very specific kinds of noise patterns, and, but they're general, I mean, they work across lots of different kinds of neural nets, which is, itself weirdly, which is itself kind of weird, that the same noise would produce the same effect. You introduce a noise filter, and this is simply kind of like a noise filter that you would use in Photoshop, and you add it to the image, you then produce the image on the right, now, which is the first image and the noise, plus the noise filter put together. Now, to us, the image on the right looks like a panda. Now to, the, now to the neural network though, it's now, been, it's now totally confused and thinks that's a given. So maybe it is, I don't know. This is well. So here's some, here's, some, here's, some other, here's some other versions of this, of uh, perturbed images, um, by which you introduce a, just a simple noise filter to, onto a network that's already trained to figure out, to, to introduce what these things are, and something in the way it sees gets sent off in ways that are quite mysterious uh, to us that it no longer can see that no longer can see it. What seems to us as a trivial a trivial transformation in the image can have these tremendously um, these tremendous effects. Okay, now now I get into the meat of the meat of the meat um, of the of this of, of this of this as well. Um, and this is where I want to sort of, I'll, I'll, I'll ask for a little bit, I'm going to focus a bit more on, on a, a, a more concentrated text. Um, and we'll ask for a bit more, uh, you know, or more focused attention. Um, the emergence of AI uh, at infrastructural scale yields more than a few naughty challenges. And, 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 and what I would want to then show to you, in, what, one, then, what I hope I'm, I'm demonstrating to you, is some of the paradoxes for, for Martin design and philosophy. Now, in doing so, what I want to say is not that somehow design, for example, would then, by talking about these things in relationship to that, that would somehow ground them, right? And like once we deal with these things, we talk about this and then ground them and, and fix the contingencies of the AI and within this some local frame of practicality. Um, it's it, it quite the opposite. We, we assume this encounter rather destabilizes both um, rather thoroughly. First of all, though, we could say that AI um, may be designed. Uh, it may evolve independently of our initial attentions for it. And, and, as well, AI may itself be uh, a designer. Uh, and so what I want to do is to focus a bit on the chimeric quality of, uh, of these, um, instead of the, um, the, the sort of folk, folk philosophies of agent and tool um, that I think a lot of the, still clouds a lot of the popular discourse and prevents AI's real creative talents from shining through. Now, because of the, its virtuosity with abstraction, Art, among other reasons, but, but art has a crucial role to play, I think, in the development and specification of the scheme over which we understand and develop AI. But at the same time, I think art's adherence, there's no artists in the room, are there? I think. Um, at the same time, however, art's adherence to routines of symbolization um, at the expense of a more demystified may also obscure that project. That is, many of the more critical and difficult challenges to art and design posed by the maturation of AI are those that disturb the gravity of the human figure as the agent and beneficiary of design and as the implied audience for our discursive gestures. More specifically, the status of representation takes on a special importance, but it's shifted on more than one axis. The representation of AI and the importance of non-anthropometric models Two, and second, the function and fate of models of representations within AI and how the role of representation works within how AI works and the shift from top-down symbolic models to more bottom-up deep learning methods uh, and then also how to, and then quite more, more difficult, how to forensically re-represent the hidden layers of that black box back to us in what, as they are still now opaque even to their programmers. 
And surely the chain of mimesis is broken several times along the way, and those breaks themselves may be translated vis visually, but if so, what abstraction would provide a sufficiently realist account of them? Now, art's encounter uh, with machine intelligence um, draws as much on anthropogeny, the study of human origins, which I discussed with you a few days ago, as it does on, its, as it does on contemporary expertise. Figural abstraction is one outcome our capacity for figural abstraction is one outcome of the cognitive revolution 70,000 years ago or so, roughly. And it enabled the eventual establishment of Neolithic economies. With that, what Wittgenstein called the ritual animal learned to index, invoke, calculate, demonstrate, encant, perform, and prototype a future condition, its various future conditions into becoming. In doing so, we also learned to confuse, however, to confuse those means and ends confuse the symbolization with what is symbolized. In our secular time, the aestheticization of politics, for example, can bemuse as much through gallery-based participatory relational negation as through the institutional spectacle of national honor and traditional demarcation. As for AI, intelligence, quote unquote, is of course a matter of identification as much as recognition. And we have many different kinds of animal and plant intelligence across the kingdoms. But today's artificial AIs and neural networks are, as I've indicated, we discussed, a kind of mineral intelligence, strange novelty. And that novelty opens up, I hope, opens up further the, the possible definition of, of intelligence and its form and, and its formalism. Um, AI, as we know, as we've just been discussing, evolved over the past half century or so, largely understood as a cognitive technology that would appear in the image of man or as a golem-like woven figure controlled by unseen forces. And the popular account of Turing's test, as we discussed, changed it from a sufficient condition of intelligence as he proposed it to a necessary qualification of intelligence through its mimetic performance of performing thinking how we think we think. And given the authority, efficacy, and charisma of symbolic models, it's not surprising that initial attempts to build AIs using modern computers relied on building logical symbolic models of a problem space and then calculating those relations top down. It did not, however, prove to this, however, did not prove to be the shining path. As we learn to engage with AIs that think without symbols, we in turn learn more about the limits and potential of our own symbolic faculties, fortunes, and misapprehensions. The open figure of the human evolves from this. Our conceptualization of the agency of design moves away from, we hope, uh, anthropocentric and androcentric philosophies of technology that posit something like Vitruvian man at the center of a concentric ring of media extensions used to act upon his intentions as they radiate from his creativity and requirements. We, we may see this, we may see, and we may see that, 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 um, that image and in any implicit or explicit expression of technical subjectivity that, suppo that supposes the designer as the primary source of designation. Instead, we should understand the steering position of design as exactly that, a position within the larger apparatus of formmaking and deformation available to dispositions that always exceed anyone's interests and ideas. That position is obviously open to many kinds of agents, but by this I don't mean an animistic projection, but simply that the tool and tool user switch seats as a matter of course. The relationships between one with, with, by which one prestheticizes the other oscillate constantly. And while this basic principle was well known to actor network theory even, and its variants, it has been probably desecularized by some new materialisms that conflate the mythologically inscribed agency of non-humans with the material agency that they actually have irrespective of human narration of their role. The frog or the cell phone, that is, doesn't know or care that it is your spirit animal, but its function in an ecological niche persists anyway, including but not limited to the fact that local hominids will interact with it according to their own motivations and totems. There are other ways to think of AI as co-designer, and if we tend to AI less as, as a kind of discourse of the fantastic than a discontiguous corporeal system with specific inputs and outputs, 
one with not only pattern recognition, but also some model making capacities of a sort, then the spectrum of its design agency is perhaps a bit clearer. And as we were talking about today, um, design research suggests that, uh, that instead of the either or dynamic of the man or machine, AI or human, we see in the sort of the Kasparov versus deep blue, um, that AI works much better in combination with other sorts of thinkers, uh, like us, for example. What's called synthetic intelligence refers to AI working in combination with human experts or other AIs or, or anything else. And in many ways, we demonstrate that it can perform more accurate pattern recognition than humans alone or AI alone. Um, and so the combinatory strategy also works, as we'll see, with how AI learns in the first place. As they set in motion the uh, dynamic evolutionary processes of gaming and form finding and lines of flight between multiple interacting gambits, these methods allow for collaboration with the distributed cognition already embodied in the code. Sometimes technologies that appear to be subordinate, such as conversational user interfaces and other systems that rely on natural language processing, may actually be making sense of their inputs and interactions for purposes quite different than those defined by a single human user. And as with any interspecies communication, collaboration is possible even if based on very different goals. So beyond human AI interaction, quite seriously, we should also consider AI and intelligent non-human animals, such as crows and ants and octopi, how they may interact and make good their plots on the world and on us as they collaborate with AIs. Lastly, um, and obviously, obviously, obviously not all thinking is intelligence, but the extent that intelligence is an emergent quality and capacity of natural and artificial systems in some way, then the, their wide spectrum should provide for diverse projects in creative engineering and expression. Um, and for many of these, our, our version is neither normative nor regulatory. The animality of automation takes flight. Now, the representation of AI, going to our list of the three representation models we want to account for, is exceedingly difficult, even, even though its achievements have been developed in proximity with philosophical thought experiments. And if we're talking about the part of the, intro, the history of, of AI and the history of philosophical thought about experiments about AI, is so closely interwoven, it's difficult to pull them apart. The reality of AI cuts across lots, many different conceptual categories. More difficult, however, again, is to understand the role of representation within AI or the lack thereof, and more difficult still is to re-represent re that lack back to us. Now, again, as art and design may make important conceptual contributions to how we understand what AI is and ought to be, Sensitivity, oversensitivity to the symbolic order, as suggested, can lead it sometimes to conflate how AI is constructed at this moment and in this time, constructed discursively, with what AI may actually be doing and what it can do, leading to a different kind of anthropocentric fallacy. The machinic phylum is more than a screen on which signification is projected, and yet we see so many critiques of AI content merely to deconstruct its most initial and superficial applications. A similar tendency based in real and honest and valid anxiety about the impact of AI, may, that what it may have on human societies but designed it by accident, offers the apparently commonsensical response that instead of, that AI must further reflect, quote, human values according to human-centered design principles. And the way to guarantee the best outcomes is to make it more human-like to humanize it. This, however, I think we see that up, sort of updates the tradition, of the, the tradition of the human as the measure of design, as the client criterion by which design is successful or beneficial, irrespective of AI, uh, irrespective, and irrespective of AI, as we think <coughs> uh, many other post-humanist critiques have demonstrated exactly how expensive this measure can be for of the human as the measure can be for ecologies and animals and anything or anyone that may not now qualify as human. So instead of mirroring human biases and arbitrary conceits, for AI to be more generally beneficial, including to us, we may instead wish to ensure that it be less human-like, 
not more. An ethical inhumanism may need to drive the policy discussion. Consider, then, as a key example, um, the problem of AI systems absorbing and replicating associations between words, addresses, names, and persons that reflect racial bias, and then, in, and then how they then may enforce those automated institutional decisions, shielded, in many cases, by the authority of their client and, uh, and prestige of their client organizations. Um, so a recently published some important research in science by uh, Island Kalaskin and, and, and collaborators, for example, has shown that machine learning systems applied to ordinary language corpora will learn human semantic biases and replicate them. S quote, some morally neutral as toward insects versus flowers, some problematic as towards race or gender, or even simply vertical, ver vertical, reflecting the status quo distribution of gender with respect to careers or first names, for example. Now, their work was their work, which was I think quite important, was also then subject to several popular articles, namely in the Guardian, that took extraordinary liberties of inference to conclude that the racism of AI programmers, like the person behind the desk, had been demonstrated by their research. When in fact, something I think much more profound and troubling was demonstrated, or even that AI is intrinsically racist itself grinding conclusions from correlations on behalf of various dulling axes. In the same issue of science as Kalaskin's paper, Anthony Greenwald discusses a similar conclusion regarding the structural bias of the syntactic and semantic associations that some machine learning systems have absorbed and considers how such systems may be used to not just replicate those biases but detect them, to trace and ultimately even correct them in ways that would probably be impossible to do if we were trying to correct the biases of humans that were otherwise sitting in that chair making those interpretations and decisions. That is, the value of such systems comes less from when they mimic and reinforce common sense than when they allow for an exteriorization, even an alienation, of perception and decision from its intuitive milieu. The patterns of risk, allowance, voice, entrance, sovereignty, that qualify an open society are now subject, are now today, as ever, subject to the expression of historical legacies of superstition, privilege, and violence that are the inheritance of the present. But just as personal genomics may disabuse anyone of the illusion of racial and national categories, we should design machine learning systems that not only do not replicate human, all too human bigotry, but which can correct bias signals at multiple points along the chain of mimesis and decision and at do so at infrastructural scale. But how? What learned counsel should train the system? And from what referent ontology do their politics of algorithm opt optimization arrive and derive? The conclusions to which a strong AI system uh, arrives may seem so unusual, uncomfortable, and unlikely to a public of human trainers that they may be dismissed as arbitrary and inhuman. That it, the human error that's reflected in the bias does not abate just because it moves from to tuning to tuning network outputs instead of providing the inputs. But is some synoptic image possible? As an epistemological engine, can the reflection of our own apophenic common sense seen against the AI's own conclusions allow it to be, and thereby us to become somewhat less deranged? To clarify, what, why, representa no, why representation within AI's processes of such concern? Let me br very briefly just make sure that we're all clear. Very briefly and extremely roughly summarize some of the distinctions between top-down and bottom-up AA, the latter, rep the latter represented by uh, contemporary deep learning systems. So first, most uh, what's called good old-fashioned artificial intelligence or GoFi uh, systems, as Ed worked according to the explica expl expl explicative power of logical models that would, in their way, quote, represent the problem space in advance such that any particular instance of a problem could be calculated, uh, supposedly, and solved according to these general rules. Now, these systems do have some advantages, um, but recent advances in deep learning and in AI in general are based on, as we've been discussing for some days, an artificial neural network to take multiple inputs weighted in, for informing weighted hidden layers to produce outputs which may be further trained and corrected. 
The resulting networks form a structure that learns, quote unquote, how to recognize, parse, compose, and or process information that is analogous to biological neural networks, which for us produce different states of mind, including memories, talents, likes, and dislikes, and so forth. Deep learning systems, however, do not form models of their input and outputs in, 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 as forms of we, anything we'd recognize as a logical model. They are a machine which can identify a particular feature in an image and do so without representation. How different this is from human cognition is, of course, an ongoing, as we've been talking the last few days, an ongoing philosophical and scientific question. It doesn't have an easy answer. It's certainly not a yes-no answer. Extending at least to going far back to uh, around this question to Descartes or the Moists in China. There are schools of thought within neuroscience and cognitive science which come to very different conclusions already before even AI as to how or even indeed if humans employ mental imagistic schema to solve through problems and if they do when they do and how important these are if they even exist. What is certain, however, is that regardless of how fundamental models and schema, logic or, logical or informal, may be to cognition, we do not actually have access to those models of our own other than by ind indirect trace, such as language or image, in that we don't actually think the way we think that we think. The inability to represent those schema as such makes our own faculties of abstraction that much more crucial. For AI, if we do not have access to our own schema, regardless of how we may or may not use them for ourselves, how could we possibly teach them to machines to, or uh, teach them to machines or make sense of what the machines are deciding accordingly without introducing so much error and structure into this that the machines are helpless? So in the play of representation and counter-representation in deep learning systems and human cognition, one slides back into the other. These related problems of how to represent AI, how representation may or may not work in AI, and how deep learning process can be forensically represented back to humans, there are echoes, as I was discussing in the, in the as I mentioned in the symposium, of Wilfred Szilard's characterization of the manifest and latent image of thought. Um, our intuitive sense of how we think is at odds with the underlying reality. And so, um, that the apparent failure, quote unquote, of good old fashioned artificial intelligence and symbolic logical model based methods may have less to do with the validity of logical model based methods of AI than it has to do with, at least partially due to the fact that the manifest images of our own behavior and models of our own world that we tried to teach it are simply inaccurate. We can't teach our models of a process to a machine because our intuitive models of our own thinking and doing may be lovely, but also wrong. More recent AI, um, as, as, we've, as, all, as, as we've been discussing, is strongly influenced instead by anti-representationalist programs that prioritize the machine intelligence, physical, sensory, and motor embodiment, and deprioritize the role of logical representations of a problem space. Uh, Rodney Brooks, Robotics 1991 polemic, Intelligence Without Representation, marked uh, an important turning point in this, uh, in this in thinking in his research. For some, the shift away from formal models to bottom-up interactions um, paralleled as well the phenomenological critique of Cartesian mental imagery for Hubert Dreyfus and Terry Rinograd, for example. Though also overemphasize, though they and Dreyfus in particular would then also overemphasize the relations to objects that this thing would have through a notional being at hand, uh, foreclosing I think important differences between hominid and machinic ways of perceiving and thinking. For others, um, this would draw from and toward an embodied, embedded form of cognition for which thinking is shaped by an organism's sensory and nervous system, its interactions with its environments as well as by its brain. So for dis distributed cognitions theories of, of, of human cognition, thinking is externalized into tools, also externalized into tools. And so for the human computer, robot, and AI interaction, an arrangement of functional artifactual surfaces allows for, for better or worse, the employment of those familiar heuristics um, and also the training of new ones. More generally, our, conce our conceptual metaphors and schema um, may not always be as, as, um, as um, 
as, again, as some neuroscientists and, and cognitive scientists will, will argue, may not be as essential for how we actually accomplish tasks as we may think, but they still do, however, allow for the shuttling mobility of metaphors and solutions between unlike domain and problems. That is, the, sche it, it, the schema that we may have in mind for how to solve a problem may not be really sort of a procedural process that we go through in order to engage with the problem. It may, in fact, be something like you don't think about playing the violin while you're playing the violin, otherwise you can't play the violin. However, the ability to understand in a certain way and abstract the schema for how one might play the violin may nevertheless apply to something totally unlike violin playing, like cooking or driving or something else as well. And it's the ability to, to, to shuttle those schema from unlike domain to from unlike domain that's something that still fundamentally eludes the research in general, in general artificial intelligence. Now, for us, the capacity to know when to apply an abstraction learned from one experience context to a different context and to consider and to simulate even possible paths is a neat talent, and one that relies largely on our big prefrontal cortex. And as said, it's considered as a benchmark for general artificial intelligence, not bound to specific application. Its own synthetic prospection would make use of very different material assemblages based on its own interactions with its sensory environments that may be rather alien to us, the way the schemas that it would make, even if we are co-present with it in those environments, even if we're somehow a character in its schema. OK. To functional abstraction. Consider this interplay in the context of contemporary AI and robotics design problems. Practical problem. One way to teach a driverless car to drive is to teach it the rules of the road and then outfit it and then outfit it with all the sensory apparatuses that it needs to gather inputs so that it can match those inputs against the rules that you taught it. Another way is to have it literally watch humans drive a lot and to make contextual and, and, and make and, and, as, and, and watch us make contextual decisions as we go. The AI, um, the AI that we're describing here then would be one that is not only the information processing uh, software, but is, is inclusive of the complex sensory apparatus that may see the world in ways quite different from us. It may see infrared light. It may use LIDAR systems to scan around the car in 360 degrees at all times. And unlike a human driver, um, the ultimate outcome then is a human AI capable of navigating its own perceptual world of the street in a way that appear appear functionally equivalent to human navigation, even if it's operating on very different schema and, uh, and may even in very different schema in doing so. Put differently, the deep learning solution, as we would describe this, the second one, um, does not rely on the recursion of human conceptual models of human conceptual models in order to train the AI but trains <coughs> artificial neural networks by feeding them input information that biases, this is the term, the formation of pattern connections within artificial neurons such that its network outputs appropriate responses appropriate to its technological function. While a network learns to pilot an autonomous vehicle by watching humans navigate normal and abnormal road conditions and to learn to perform quote unquote driving, it is not learning a human model of driving, nevertheless. Even though human drivers are under observation, the AI, it produces its own functional responses to the problem space of driving without necessarily producing represent comprehensive model representations of that problem space. So, as encephalization, uh, brain, how things turn into brains, evolved as a kind of emergent feedback system to serve the needs of the body that hosts the brain, for the AI driver, thinking is the intensification of a particular pattern in the network layers. It does not, once more, require a formical logical representation of its own processes. And indeed, uh, and, and, and quite in fact, human driving may not actually need all that much in this as well. If you were trying to teach someone how to drive, you realize how, how little your understanding of driving and your ability to drive is based on your own formal schematic understanding of what driving is. The network expresses instead intelligent outcomes, but of what sort? Is training the AI driver, think of it this way, is training the AI driver by watching humans in this way akin to training a dog to understand commands about the world or more like, quote, training a rock with cuts to be sharp enough to have arrowhead functionality? It's sort of a physical training of the network to produce certain kinds of functional effects. 
if the acquisition, and maybe our own cognition is closer to this than we'd like to think, if the acquisition and manipulation of technologies lead to the evolution of our own higher brain functions, again, some of this discussion that I've been talking about, how the acquisition of language was a function of this manipulation of tools, at what point does AI as tool and AI as user acquire the same capacities along a similar disparate path? As what way does it learn to have this own capacity to, um, to produce in this way? That, the, that its own capacities for abstraction are the result of, are, 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 the, are the emergent result of this functional training of its capacities to, to think and interact with the world. The answer is obviously rather philosophically complex, but also legally fraught as well. The, 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 the law around AI and, and robotics is dealing with this issue in ways where it's, you know, with uh, all hands on deck. Should an autonomous car trained in this way one decide one fine day to just stop or to do something even more weird, it may do so for reasons that are unknown and perhaps unknowable. Artificial neural networks may, in their own way, form something like, ultimately something like quote unquote models, though it's not really the right word. But even if so, that does not mean that those models are themselves directly representable as models to us. Model of what and for whom. This does not stop, however, regulatory bodies from demanding that owners of AI systems be ready to account for and represent the decisions of their machines, similar to how the we already, have already existing legal criteria by which decisions of human employees must be auditable. So if you're, you're gonna give bank loans or not give bank loans to people, you need to disclose the criteria. You're automating this process with deep learning systems, you may not be able to. You may not, it may not be possible for us to produce a model of its model in order to uh, be able to abide by the law. It's not an unreasonable request, but it may be impossible. So to summarize, um, we have multiple models of representation or its absence in play. There's a model of how a human thinks that a human drives a car, the manifest image of behavior. There's a model of how humans model this model to teach an AI to drive a car, good old fashioned AI. There is a quote, quote model, quote unquote model of how a deep learning system is trained to drive a car, which may be inscrutable. And finally, there is a model of that deep learning model that must be re-represented represent, back to humans so they know what's going on and decide on its legality, propriety, or viability, the latter being potentially um, uh, a unicorn. Optimistically, these may form a kind of synoptic image in which our own manifest model is re-informed, re-trained in, in, in back by the representation of the deep learning model. We may learn more about how we do those things by learning how it, see, how it does those things in the image of our doing those things, a, a different kind of ex exteriorization and productive alienation, the same way in which the development of, of multi-point perspective allowed us to see perception outside of perception and to model and manipulate perception as something that was not just experienced by the perceiving object but could be, again, perceiving perception, right? Um, yeah, we begin to learn from the AI by seeing our model from the outside perspective that it's provided. For the societal comprehension and absorption of AI, we may allow for the potential political implications or translation of translation or more precisely of abstraction. on representation and art. The coupling of AI, robotics, and synthetic sensing produces, as well as we discussed, form pseudo-species that inhabit quite different life worlds than our own, but intersecting with ours. Another kind of black box to consider are the dark factories in which manufacturing robots assemble other machines in environments that are pitch black for us, because why would machines that are assembling that, that don't see need light? So here's a picture um, that I prepared based on a field trip that we took um, to a, one of the dark factories uh, in China. And we see here is a, a lawnmower assembly. Um, in that machine vision may account for a plural, and in that machine vision may account for a plurality of images, quote unquote images that are generated today. Landscapes such as these even though there's no light, are arguably a true home for contemporary visual culture, even if they're dark as a cave. 
And in that new technology of vision have always framed how we interpret the historical archive. We may presume that the predominance of machine vision will shift how it's possible to also critique perception and perspective. Um, now, I'm not the only one who thinking about this, obviously. Similar conclusions are shared by more than a few contemporary artists. Um, Trevor Paglin, a friend of mine whose explorations at the edges of photography are now trained on, on what machine vision sees, including us. Um, and in discussions with Trevor, we've talked, we've discussed the, the difficulty of, again, appropriately naming um, the uncanny things that these systems do, like do we even call it vision or do we need to make up a new words for it? What is the real project of kind of neologisms that would allow us to, to talk about these things as such? Um, and the weird things that the system creates within its, prosop, oh, in its process, which may appear to us, as we've been looking at, as a kind of proto-images or pseudo-images or partial images or, or, or who knows what. And the need for a more effective glossary. The, art his, the traditional art historical discourse, um, even when it does, however, even when it does recognize the importance of machine vision, sort of seems to be stuck um, with the horseless carriage metaphors to describe what it sees. And frankly, we all are. Um, more is required just for art's sake. Th th this, by a way, I'll sort of show you. It's like, you know, remember I showed you those images earlier of like this is the sort of, this is the way in which the network is trained to sort of find the, the sort of the meta uh, uh, lawnmower or cheetah or those sorts of things where it produces this weird, this weird sort of actually that kind of looks like that thing but doesn't really look like that thing but it's a visual. We're asking it to represent what it's doing in order to what is the rule by which the filter by which to find that thing and we like so this is a similar thing of a shark and basically what this is is thousands of training images of sharks and not sharks things that have shark in it things that don't have shark in it and then what you're asking it to do what you ask it to do and a lot of those other ones as well is to um, once it's figuring out where which ones have shark in it which ones don't have shark into it to represent all of the properties that rep that are associated with shark minus all of the properties in the images that have sharks in them that are not shark. So that's the meta shark. <laughs> and again, to us it looks really abstract, right? It's a kind of, you know, um, it looks like a minimalist painting. Um, to the deep learning network, it's the, it would be, we would say this is the most um, uh, uh, rigorously realist representation of shark that would be available. Um, so these are some of the things I asked Trevor to send along. What, what he calls neurots, we're to figure out a bigger thing. So if at different points within the, the networks that are being trained to recognize a particular object, and again, some of these hidden layers, maybe 10 layers or 20 layers or 30 layers deep, and it's trained at one layer, which then is reinforced at another and reinforced at another and reinforced at another, and, there, and, and the output shows you a picture of sort of something as length, but any one of these layers is only kind of like a partial slice of what of how it's processing, but you can take one of those layers and say, okay, tell me what you're what you're processing, what you're seeing. You get things like this, um, where it's trying to sort of figure out what some things are, and some things you recognize as as eggs or creatures. But sometimes there'll be things that like have nothing, that seemingly have nothing to do with the images you trained it or the output. But somewhere along the line, there's this process of going on here as well. It's all, you know, it's like what happens when you look inside something's brain. Now, um, as, I, as I was suggesting, we, we want to then, why we're, I'm talking about this here, we, we want to not only think of machine vision as a new way to make images, um, we want to think of it as a way as well to visualize and conceive AI's own capacity for provisional abstraction. Not only visual abstraction, but procedural and, 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 and epistemic abstraction. If, if they're even is there, and if those are even the right words, and they may not be the right words, and I, I'm totally open to that. Um, but weaving then between the hidden layers, moving further or closer away from the pictorial, we find these genuine abstract machines. And in response, art tries to articulate a vocabulary of what is and what is not at work for us and apart from us. Now, in moving with or about and among machine vision, this research I, I would suggest is deeply important point of leverage because it deals directly into the ontogenesis of raw physical sensation as folded into mineral intelligence. It measures the shadows as they are burned. More, more polemically, um, an active engagement to define normative AI 
by positive projection as well as by counter-normative negation is required. And it's one that may mobilize our most nuanced techniques further towards numinous self-disenchantment, a setting loose of abstraction of the processes of abstraction as a physical and political process, not, the, not, as the, not, not uh, abstraction as the preservation of its traditional authority as a metaphysics of ceremony. Distinctions are necessary then between matter that actually thinks and can work back upon the world according, accordingly and matter that merely occupies a common plane in a proposed flat ontology, for example. The latter, um, tends to conflate AI with panpsychic idealism, tends to think of those in the same way, but the former, one I would like, is no more animistic, I think, than marveling at a locomotive. Art's articulation of knowing through abstraction and mechanic processes far precedes deep learning historically, and, and a glossary of sensitive neologisms indexing what machine vision is doing or may provide may provide a way into and not out of the problems of AI and representation. And I would also say that Boris's, Boris Groys's discussion of the inferential cybernetics of minimalism and its mimesis of thinking um, is particularly relevant here. Um, with machine vision as both a point of contact between AI and its worlds and as a trace reserved for us to imagine and even present what AI is, we discovered that the most realistic depiction may be bracingly abstract, just as what is depicted is, is itself a process of abstraction. It's the key, abstraction as realism. Okay. Now, lastly, in the winding up here, abstraction in this sense is a reduction of a, we could define as the reduction of a condition to a form, the old definition of abstraction, a reduction of a condition to a form, through which one may also re-represent conditions other than that from which the figure is drawn. It's the second part of the shuttling of the schema that's important here. The glossary as described, this hypothetical glossary that would name all this stuff and that's not a horseless carriage metaphor, would place certain machine vision AI processes and their effects into interpretive categories. This is not only a set theory problem, it's also a functional dimensional reduction. And for all reductions, from data compression to abstract expressionism, Raw information may be lost, but an interpretable clarity of pattern is gained. This is a necessary, this is necessary, are you, to make sense of the sentient matter we release out into the world. And so art and design have an essential hooray and privileged seat at the big back propagation table where, where, we, went, where we try to train AI and are, are ourselves in turn counter-trained by the AI in evolutionary symbiosis. But in order to make good on this, quitting certain precious demands regarding the, the realism of anthropological self-representations is likely table stakes. Okay, now the last couple things before we have probably have some discussion. Um, a few things I'd like to, again, you know, I, part of this question of language and then these distinctions of language and technology at work here I think are quite interesting in terms of how they may shift um, and the ontological function of language here um, and this as well. Um, there's a project we're sort of interested in of thinking of, thinking of how AI may, may be able to teach languages to AIs, um, the syntactical and semantic structures of languages in such a way that disappearing languages, because languages themselves are disappearing faster than as much as species are, and the extinction of language we may see as a kind of extinctions of ontologies. Can we use AI to make a kind of ont ontology bank that we may have as a seed bank, such that those AI, these languages might be let back out into the world in a different sort of way as well? Of course, not in their original context, but maybe in a different context of this as well. And you know, I'm also, there's you know, there's been a number of research on this sort of question it has to do with the kind of general you know neural capacities of language where you do neural imaging on people who are you know you, you tell them a story in one language and the same parts of the brain light up that if you tell them the language in another story and you tell them the same story in another language and then translate and translate and translate all the way through. There's certain kind of persistence of pattern in terms of how we enter that that suggests that um, uh, that this is not totally um, this is totally not off base. The real question that we want to ask of this as well is how does this fit into, um, sorry, into this picture here, uh, the diagram that we'll, I, will, I will bring home with me for this as well, and to whether or not, we, I think we would all 
be willing to, I would assume we would all probably be willing to accede that AI can be one of the ways in which a, a creature with a particular transcendental frame is able to move slightly within the case space. Right? We can use the AI as a kind of synthetic prosthesis that would allow us to slightly see the world in a slightly different way that would allow us to move a little bit in that case space and to, and to see the world differently and see by, by the extent to which we're also seeing the world through its lens a little bit as well. The real question though is put in these terms is what would be what are the conditions by which we would we would allow that an AI or what kind of AI, what would an AI have to do or be, at what point would we say that it is capable of having its own transcendental frame on the world? It certainly can sense the world differently than we do it. How much processing, how much complexity of its interest in the world do we need that we need to be? Does it need to be before we say it actually has its own transcendental frame? This is a, a different way of shifting the question of intelligence. Right? because it has more to do with the kind of perception and processing and embodiment and sensing than it does with simply you know, this capacity of this, of this as well. And what would the terms for this to be? Of course, it's open to definition, how you think about the definition of what those terms shift in the transcendental frame, in fact, might be, which was the discussion that, that we had that was later here ensued. By one, on one hand, we could say that there's a kind of extremely local version of the transcendental frame, that there's a transcendental frame of economics and a transcendental frame of ethnography and a transcendental frame of, you know, if I had too much sugar in the morning, I have a different transcendental frame than in the afternoon, you could get to sit down as well. But more, I think more importantly, you, there's the zooming out to the transcendental frame that may be common among hominids, that may be common among animals, that may be common among other sorts of things that, that operate in certain kinds of space kind of continuums and, and different kind of astronomic and planetary relations that we might work with that have more to do with thinking of these kinds of definitions. And it's, this is the question, I guess, in a way, is to what extent are there, what would be the positions within uh, of, of locating and understanding the, the, the capacities of, 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 of these kinds of machinic intelligence? I'm not saying it's there already, I don't know, maybe it already is, but maybe it's, it obviously it's a definitional question in a certain way. But at what point would we allow this and sort of see for this as well? And I don't have a simple answer for this, for this kind of space as well. Um, yeah, anyway, thank you very much. Thanks for the time.